and we are live what's happening everyone welcome back to the punch perfect boxing channel before we get going today please make sure to like the video comment your prediction for this fight down below and if you're new please make sure to subscribe to the channel today i'm going to be doing my punch perfect preview and prediction for anthony joshua taking on otto varlin this saturday night in saudi arabia on the day of reckoning live on tnt and the zone pay-per-view this is essentially a semi-final for Anthony Joshua this weekend. If he can beat Otto Varlin and on the same night Deontay Wilder comes through Joseph Parker, we will finally see the mega fight between Anthony Joshua and Deontay Wilder in Saudi Arabia in 2024 and likely in the first half of the year. However, both men have extremely tough fights this weekend. Both men have a banana skin laid out in front of them and it's up to them to not slip up and not prevent one of the biggest fights in boxing from happening next year. If you want to know my thoughts on Deontay Wilder versus Joseph Parker, then please go over to my preview and prediction video, which is out now, and you can hear my thoughts on that fight. And ultimately, whether I think with this prediction and the prediction in that fight, whether we're going to get this mega fight in 2024. But concentrating on this matchup today, many people, not just before this fight was announced, but you know, since this fight has been announced and for years prior, have felt that Otto Varlin is the worst possible opponent for Anthony Joshua. With his recent struggles against a southpaw in Alexander Usyk. Many people feel that going in against another southpaw, where he never quite figured out the code and solved the puzzle of Alexander Usyk, could mean that we see Anthony Joshua slip up once again. And I don't think this is just an Anthony Joshua thing. I know that people feel like he's no longer the same fighter. You know, mentally he's broken, he's fragile, he's not the same guy that he once was. But even if you put all that to one side, Otto Varlin has just been viewed as a banana skin for the entire division. Ever since he fought Tyson Fury, and that was a fight where when he went into that matchup, many people felt that he wasn't deserving of it. Many people felt, why is Tyson Fury taking on Otto Violin? You know, Tyson Fury is one of the best heavyweights on the planet. He should be taking on someone better than Otto Violin. And since we saw Tyson Fury really struggle in that fight, you know, he was cut. It was a grueling physical fight that was just harder than he ever anticipated or any of us fans ever anticipated. Otto Violin, since then has been viewed as a banana skin for the rest of the division. And that night was almost a gift and a curse for Violin because it proved that he's a world-class heavyweight, but it meant that no one else wanted to go near him. And we've seen talks for big fights for him over recent years. You know, he was scheduled to face Dillian White. Dillian White ended up pulling out of that fight because he didn't want to jeopardise the Tyson Fury payday that was looming and he was waiting for a ruling from the WBC. So Otto Violin has been in a difficult stage over the last couple of years where he's a top heavyweight, but he hasn't had the fights to really cement that. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but that's resulted in some lacklustre performances, which we'll cover when we look at Otto Varlin and his career. But concentrating first and foremost on AJ, I think it's great that we've seen his activity pick up this year. One of my bugbears about AJ was that we just haven't seen enough of him over recent years. You know, he's been fighting once a year, and some of that's not through his own fault. Some of that is just, you know, Tyson Fury, when that fight was rumoured to be negotiated, Fury ends up having to take on Deontay Wilder again. You know, fighting Alexander Usyk, the rematch was in Saudi Arabia, and those fights can take longer to deliver. Um, you know, change of trainer and needing to take some extra time to link up with a new trainer, Robert Garcia, and then Derek James. You know, there's been so many reasons for delays over the last couple of years that I think AJ this year, the priority was to just get active again, find a new trainer in Derek James and get active. We'll talk about the trainer thing in a minute, but that was the most important thing for AJ this year. And for me, I said, even at the start of the year, whilst I hold AJ to a high standard because he's been a two-time unified heavyweight champion of the world and he is a world-class heavyweight and for me, still a top five heavyweight, I wouldn't mind seeing him drop down a level or two this year just to build some confidence and work on some things with Derry James. So we saw him against Jermaine Franklin back in April. Wasn't as convincing as we would have liked to have seen from AJ. I think many people weren't happy with the Jermaine Franklin fight, but the excuse that you were going to allow AJ was, well, if it gets him a knockout on the record and gets some confidence back, I'm all for it. And he didn't deliver that. And he had his nose busted and he got touched up a little bit in that fight. There were some things that were an improvement. You know, he boxed very well behind the jab and we started to see that old AJ come back. He wasn't just a headhunter. So there were some improvements, but still some questions. But that's kind of what we wanted to see from AJ. Although we've become accustomed to the big knockouts over the years and the exciting fights and the jeopardy as well of him getting clipped and getting put down as well. We do want to see improvement with a new trainer in Derek James. And then once he got through Jermaine Franklin, 
He had the fight lined up against Dillian White, the rematch in the pros. Dillian White fails a drug test, so the fight gets pulled last minute, and Dillian White is replaced with Robert Hellanius. There's not a lot AJ could have done about that. You can't hold that against AJ that he's having to take on a different fighter. And Robert Hellanius, whilst he's going to be no world beater, he's still a respectable heavyweight, especially on short notice. You know, the Nordic Nightmare, he's a big guy, he can punch a little bit, and he's going to be difficult to figure out, at least for a couple of rounds. And to Robert Hellanius's credit, obviously we later found out that he also popped for PEDs, but he came out there and he looked to push AJ back. And again, AJ was marked up. AJ took a lot of shots in that fight. But I think it was because AJ was just looking to get through Robert Hellanius as easily as he could. And eventually, he finally got that knockout that we've been waiting to see from AJ. AJ, just in recent years, even in his wins over the likes of Kubrat Pulev and you know, his wins over Andy Ruiz, in the Andy Ruiz rematch, he was very tentative and he boxed to a strict game plan and we didn't really get to see the exciting, powerful, explosive AJ. In the Pulev fight, we saw glimpses of it, but he tired out and then had to go into the latter half of the fight to get the knockout. We needed to see a clinical performance from AJ where he just gets rid of someone in the middle, early part of the fight. And he did that against Hellenius. And I think it's the confidence booster that AJ needed to feel. He just needed to walk around like a man that could chin anyone at any given moment. So I feel like this year has helped AJ rebuild some confidence. Do I feel he's still the fighter that he was many years ago? No, I think that's changed. I think once there is a seed of doubt planted in your mind, it's almost impossible to get rid of that. I felt that it was planted back when he fought Vladimir Klitschko. A lot of people feel it was the Andy Ruiz fight that ruined him and then Usyk ruined him even more. I think Klitschko is the fight that planted that seed of doubt in AJ that he's not invincible and that whilst he can come through adversity, it can all go wrong for you in a split second. And then against Andy Ruiz, all those fears came to life. And then against Alexander Usyk, I think mentally he was just so... Uh, just sort of worn out and fatigued from the pressure and the complexity of Alexander Usyk that it all just came to a head. But Anthony Joshua, whether you like him or not, whether you like his behaviour or not, whether you don't like the media trained version, whether you don't like the outspoken version, a lot of people seem to find a way to always hate AJ no matter what he does. I've had my you know, issues with AJ over recent years, but the fact remains that he's one of the most exciting heavyweights on the planet because when the jeopardy is there, and also the potential of an explosive knockout is there. He's must-see TV, and I want to see the Deontay Wilder fight next year. The big question mark coming into this fight, away from your doubts about him mentally and whether he's still the same guy or the same fighter, is another change in trainer. Now, you can look at it many ways with him linking up with Ben Davison. Now, first and foremost, I just think logistically, that's why he linked up with Ben Davison. You know, the fight was announced. Um, you know, he hasn't had a necessarily a full camp for this, like a 12, 14 week camp. He's had a shorter camp for this fight. And that's meant that logistically, are you going to travel to Dallas to work with Derek James and then get back to the UK, then to Saudi and do a lot of traveling and lose a lot of training time through traveling? You need to be somewhere where you can set up camp and focus just for six, seven weeks and then go into the fight. And I feel like linking up with Ben Davison's enabled him to do that. So I think that's a plus and I think logistically it makes sense. The positives of linking up with Ben Davison is Ben Davison's a good trainer. You can have your issues with Ben Davison, but the fact is he is a good trainer. He's one of the best trainers in the UK. He's made some fighters worse, like Josh Taylor. He's made some fighters a hell of a lot better, like Lee Wood. He's improved fighters, and he's taken away from fighters as well. But he's a good trainer nonetheless. The way you can look at it positively is that he has prepared a fighter to fight Otto Valin before in Tyson Fury. And... Ultimately, it was the reason he got sacked heading into the uh, Deontay Wilder rematch. But he's at least prepared someone and done enough study and knows Otto Valin and has now actually had a fighter take him on and struggle with him. He can see where Otto Valin can cause some issues for AJ. So I think all of that's a plus. Where I don't think it's necessarily the best fit is that I think Ben Davison can sometimes be guilty of overthinking things. When you hear him talk, he, he's a bit of an overthinker. Sometimes he overanalyzes. You know, he's got an analytical team with Lee Wiley and they look into every minute detail. And for someone like AJ, who I think sometimes is just best when he goes out there and acts and behaves and fights like a six foot five heavyweight that's built like a Greek god and punches like a mule and just goes out there and relies on instinct. I think that's sometimes where AJ is most dangerous. 
when AJ thinks like he did in the uh, Usyk first fight where he was overthinking everything and he wasn't clear on the game plan and he was seeking reassurance all the time, didn't really know what was going on, that's where I worry about AJ. And are we going to get a scenario where, a bit like Joshua Boatze linking up with Virgil Hunter to use an example, both deep thinkers, both overanalyze things, both really think about the small details of absolutely everything. And I feel like that can rub off on you on the in a bad way. Sometimes you need a guy that can bring out the best in you mentally and physically. So I'm not sure Ben Davidson personality-wise is maybe the best fit for Anthony Joshua. The other thing I would be concerned about is I think the style of fighting that Ben Davidson teaches is someone that maybe is a little bit raw and rugged and can fine-tune them and polish them. What he's done with Lee Wood, you know, a bit of a sort of British level operator that was a bit of a rough diamond, and he's moulded him into a world class fighter in Lee Wood. You know, with fighters like Josh Taylor, who was already world class, he wasn't able to elevate him to the next level. Is that going to be the case this weekend with Anthony Joshua? Is he going to struggle to elevate an already world class fighter? Because we haven't really necessarily seen that with Ben Davison. You know, Lee Wood wasn't a world class fighter before that fight. And we've seen Ben Davison work with Tyson Fury and work with Billy Joe Saunders and them not really elevate their game or look like they're improving or Josh Taylor and look like they're getting to the next level. So I have my doubts about the Ben Davison link up. The one thing I do hope is that they're not trying to encourage AJ to box. I would like to see AJ be aggressive in this fight, and we'll get into the tactical and technical breakdown of it as we come more towards the end of the video. But that's enough on AJ. Let's talk a little bit about Otto Varlin. And how do I rate him? Do I view him as the banana skin that everyone makes him out to be? I'll be honest, I think he's slightly overrated. I think Otto Varlin kind of sits between the levels of southpaws that, that Anthony Joshua has faced at world level. You know, when he won the IBF title, his first world title against Charles Martin, and then when he lost his unified titles and then lost again to Alexander Usyk, those are the two high-profile southpaws that AJ has faced, you know, since being on the world stage. And Charles Martin is kind of at one level of the spectrum, and then Alexander Usyk is right at the top. I think Otto Violin kind of sits bang in the middle. I think if you were to be generous to him, you'd say he's closer to U6 level than he is to Charles Martin. But really and truly, I feel he just kind of sits in the middle. Although we look at the Fury fight and we look at just his film and the way he fights and the skill set that he has, and you can look at some of his performances against sort of fringe level guys at heavyweight like Murat Gassiev and like Dominic Brazil, I do think that he's not quite the world level fight that people make him out to be. He has a wonderful trainer in his corner in Joe Gamache, who I've got a ton of respect for. He's one of the people that I like the most in boxing. He's someone I'd love to interview one day. I think he's a fantastic mind, a fantastic coach, and a brilliant trainer. And I feel like that helps Otto Violin, that he's got a great corner. And where AJ perhaps lacks a bit of continuity and a bit of a relationship and chemistry in the corner, that's one thing Otto Violin definitely has this weekend as an advantage going into this fight. But Otto Violin has had some mixed performances over the year. The Tyson Fury fight is the one where people became familiar with him. Since then, he's failed to land a big fight through no fault of his own. But that's led to a lot of lacklustre performances where Violin has kind of just gone through the motions and hasn't really turned up. You know, Camille Sokolowski didn't look good in that fight. Many people thought Sokolowski beat him. I think that that was Violin just rocking up on short notice, not in shape, and just hoping his skills enough to get through it. Then the Rydell Booker fight that followed, that went the distance as well and wasn't particularly impressive. So we've had mixed performances. But in between those performances and either side of those performances and since Fury, he's had some world-level wins in the likes of Dominic Brazil, in the likes of Murat Gassiev. Now, Murat Gassiev not necessarily set the world alight at, at heavyweight, but that was a fight that Violin needed to win well enough over in Turkey because Murat Gassiev had the promotional uh, outfit on his side, so he needed to win the fight well enough to not get uh, uh, done over on the scorecards. But the wins against Dominic Brazil and against Murat Gassiev prove that you're a top 10, top 15 guy. But even in those fights, I think there's still moments in them where you look at and go, not all that convincing. You know, Dominic Brazil late on in the fight, I think, got to Violin a little bit. You know, Murat Gassiev just never quite pulled the trigger enough. And Violin was able to sort of just sort of tip tap his way to a decision in the end. Gassiev just didn't look as fluid as he once did at Cruiserweight. Take nothing away from Violin because I think he stifled him as much as he could. But Gassiev just didn't quite look like a guy that had been boxing at world level at heavyweight and looked like a guy that was in the shape that he used to be down at Cruiserweight. It looked like he bulked up too much. So Violin has these fringe world level wins, 
but doesn't quite have that world level win right now. But you look at the talent, you look at the film, and you can't help but feel that's a world level level heavyweight. And as a southpaw, as a big man, you think he's going to give a lot of trouble to any heavyweight that he gets in the ring with. So I think it's interesting. Violin goes into this full of confidence. He feels that AJ is not the same fighter as someone that's fought AJ, sparred AJ. For him to say that, he must see something. He must look at the recent fights and think that's not the same guy that I've sparred or shared the ring with. So he'll take some confidence in that. Also, as I mentioned, Joe Gamache being in his corner, there's continuity there. He's got a great team around him. He'll feel very confident going into this fight as well. So there's a lot of reasons to like Otto Violin heading into this. But let's look at the technical aspects and ultimately why I think the fight will play out the way that it's going to play out. Anthony Joshua is going to encounter a lot of issues if he decides to have this fight in the centre of the ring or he decides to go on the back foot. A lot of people have struggled against Otto Violin when they give him the upper hand and give him control of the centre of the ring. The reason Tyson Fury really struggled with him is because he tried to outbox him and let Violin come forward and it became a really messy, ugly fight where Violin was able to get up close and get some work done and make it horrible on the inside. That's not where AJ wants it. Whilst AJ is a good boxer, he's not an elite operator off the back foot. And he can get guilty of having to concentrate too much and having to focus so much that he doesn't let his punches flow and doesn't let his punches do the talking. He gets a bit uptight and he's trying too hard to respond to everything that his opponent does. AJ at his best is when he controls and asserts dominance of the center of the ring. If he cannot do that and Otto Violin gets control of that and pushes him back, then AJ is going to encounter some issues. If AJ can get control of that center of the ring and start to push him back, I think that's where he can be highly successful. A lot of people feel that AJ since uh, the Andy Ruiz fight and even since Alexander Usyk has become better defensively. I don't think that's necessarily true. AJ had his nose busted against Franklin and he was marked up heavily against Hellenius. AJ has taken a lot of shots, but what AJ is doing is not taking as heavy shots and he's not putting himself in as vulnerable positions as he once did. He's not taking the risks that he used to. His offense is suffering because of that, but that does mean defensively he's not quite putting himself in those positions where he's ready to get knocked out at any given moment or hurt or put down at any given moment. If he goes onto the back foot, I feel that it's just allowing Otto Violin to feel his way into the fight and wait for the right moment to land that shot and start to get to him. If he can put Violin on the back foot, I feel he's got all the makings to get to him. AJ has a fantastic jab. And over the years, especially when he was coming up and coming through to world level, that jab was money. It was one of the best in the sport. We've seen it neglected over recent years as he's had to overthink. In the Ruiz rematch, it was fantastic, but we've never really seen it since then. And Alexander Usyk played a factor in that because he was slipping every jab that AJ threw and he wasn't able to commit to it because he never knew where Usyk was going to be or what he was going to do next. This fight, Violin is not as elusive and he's not as skilled as Alexander Usyk and he doesn't move like Alexander Usyk. Usyk can move to his left, he can move to his right, he's going to make you slip, he's going to counter you, he's going to lead off. None of that complexity is there with Otto Violin. He always moves to his right, and it's about how could you make him move to his left to bring him in rage of that big right hand. So it's going to be a lot more of a toned down version. The puzzle isn't going to be as difficult to solve for AJ. But for me, it's how he does everything with that left hand. If he can lead off with that left hand and stop Violin from moving to his right, then he makes the fight a lot easier on himself, AJ. Because Violin's not going to be able to lead off with his own right hand if you're keeping him moving to his left, because that's not what he wants to do. If Violin is moving to his right where he's comfortable, he's going to be able to outbox AJ, and he's going to be able to make AJ constantly turn and pivot and not find the right angles or positions to throw his right hand. So AJ has got to cut off the ring with his feet, use the lead hand to bring Violin across to his left, and that's where the right hand comes into play. If you watch the Brazil fight, and if you watch any of Otto Violin's kind of high-level fights, the best guys that he's faced, he likes to put his hands up and defend shots, whereas Usyk is constantly slipping them and looking to throw something back. Violin will defend them and then throw something back when the sequence then reinitiates. I think that presents plenty of opportunities for Anthony Joshua to throw through the middle. Dominic Brazil was kind of winging them in wide and Violin was just sort of leaning back and putting his hands up. That opens a gap through the middle. If AJ can throw to the body, that'll open up the opportunity for the upper to, uppercut to come through the middle as well. And I think Anthony Joshua... If he gets the tactics and the game plan right, can make this fight look a lot easier than people think. 
I have my doubts about AJ. I'm concerned that he's not the fighter that he once was. I've said it for many years since the Klitschko fight that he's not quite the same guy. And it almost feels silly of me to pick him to win by knockout here. I think the decision is a safe bet. It's, if it's a close fight, he's going to get the nod because they won't want to jeopardise uh, the potential of AJ versus Wilder. I think it's the same in Wilder versus Parker as well. We saw with Fury and Garnu that Fury ultimately got the win in that fight because they don't want to jeopardise Fury versus Usyk. I feel that Anthony Joshua is going to get the knockout here. I really do. Varlin always has these rounds sort of between sort of 8, 9, 10 where he looks a little bit sketchy. He ties a little bit, the concentrations level drop, and he starts to feel the pace of the fight. He did it against Brazil, and I thought he did it against Gassiev as well. AJ does catch a second wind in fights. Whether it's against Usyk in the rematch, where he was you know, struggling at points, but he had that round where he had Usyk reeling. It was just that Usyk then had three or four more gears to go through. Valin doesn't have that. And even in fights where AJ tails off in the middle rounds like he did against... Uh, Kubrat Pulev, for example, after hurting him early, he always finds a second win, like he did against Klitschko, like he did against Pulev, like he did against Povetkin, and I think he'll do the same here this weekend. And whilst he'll struggle throughout points, and I think he might overthink it, as the fight starts to progress, I think he'll almost do a bit of a Lee Wood and ditch the boxing, go back to using what he does best and rely on his power and his athleticism, and I think AJ will get to Otto Valin around 9, 10 or 11 and get him out of there and get a big win. I think AJ looks highly up for this fight. I think the fact that he's fought Otto Valin, beat Otto Valin, sparred Otto Valin, gives AJ some comfort and reassurance that he hasn't had against recent opponents. Against Usyk, even in the rematch, I don't think it helped that he'd shared the ring with him before. Um, against a lot of you know opponents that he hasn't faced before and the likes of Franklin, I don't think that helps him either. But going in against someone that he's beaten and knows he can beat, I think that makes AJ feel confident and comfortable. And that's why he's talking with such vim and such aggression at the press conferences. With Deontay Wilder being on the card and with so many Frank Warren fighters and Frank Warren personnel being involved in the event, that's clearly got AJ's back up as well as we saw at the press conference as he went at Dev Sarni and made some comments. And Wilder, you know, he's going to be there. He's going to be at ringside. He's going to be preparing for his own fight. And he could potentially produce a knockout that is going to cause highlights all over social media as well. I think there's a lot of motivation and that extra bit between the teeth for AJ this weekend to go out there and get the knockout. So I'm going for AJ to win by knockout between rounds 8 and 12. Let me know your thoughts down below, guys. Please make sure to subscribe to the channel. There are loads of prediction videos coming this week. A good solid 10 prediction videos. So make sure to subscribe. Check them all out. And I'll catch you next time. Thank you.